Okay, so let's see here. So I want to um, welcome our speaker uh, officially, uh, Steve Froing from North Carolina, speaking to us about fragrant orchids, of which he's also got a book um, by the same title. And this is his first slide. So Steve, can you see everything okay? Steve, are you on mute? Okay, now you can hear me, right? Yes, sir. Okay, I don't have anything on my screen except you. Oh, do you see? Oh, am I not sharing? Okay, let me fix it. Thank you. <laughs> that would help. Okay, I got Better? it. Better? <laughs> okay, we're ready to go? We're ready to go. Sorry for the delay. No problem. So you'll be the one to change slides as needed, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me here. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to, I, I took some extra coffee, so I'll, I'll stay up a little bit later tonight. Uh, so anyway, I, I was thinking about this talk. The last time I gave this talk was, was at Atlanta. And, um, and I was to meet the group at this Thai restaurant and, um, and my wife was with me and we, we drove all over the place, Atlanta. Any of you been there? Of course, I can't talk about bad traffic since you guys are in San Francisco, but I mean, in Atlanta in the Southeast is the worst traffic. So I was, we were driving to this Thai restaurant and we finally got there and I, I sat around the table and talked with the folks and uh, they said, what are you talking about? I said, fragrant orchids. And they said, well, that's really interesting topic because we've never had a topic like that and I said oh that's right so I was getting ready to order and then I then I noticed that uh, and when I came into the restaurant they they took me to the to the group they said are you here for the group and I said yeah I took, they took me there and um, so I was chatting with them chatting with them and finally uh, I got a call and uh, the lady that was president of the Orchid Society in Atlanta said where are you and I said I'm at the Thai restaurant and I realized I was with the Porsche Society, the Porsche Car Society. <laughs> how was how it the wrong Thai restaurant, which was on Peach Tree? Well, you know, if you go to Atlanta, everything's on Peach Tree. And it was the same name restaurant, and it was the same on Peach Tree. So that's what I remember about last fragrant organ talk. So I'm happy this isn't so confusing. It's a lot easier to be online. Uh, thank you for having me here. I'm happy to be talking about fragrant orchids. Um, and if you can go to the next slide. Um, it, the next slide shows that um, I did write this book on fragrant orchids. Unfortunately, um, orchid books, as I'm sure you guys know, go out of print very quickly. And um, this is out of print now, too. So it's really uh, a pain that they do that. They just print it one time, and then it goes out of print. So um, what I did do, make available, and I mentioned it to Jeff, is I, I did make a, a PDF file, which can, includes all the images in high resolution. Uh, in a, I put it on a CD. So it has everything in the book, and it's also searchable because it's in PDF. So if you want that, I, I, made, I made that available. If you would like that, uh, let's see. I put that at uh, $12.95 postpaid. So if you email me and pay me by PayPal or something, I can send it out to you. But it's really that's the, otherwise you have you can buy it used sometimes on uh, on e on eBay or on uh, Amazon. But unfortunately, it's out of print. So uh, next slide, please. Are you? Um, you know, it's funny. I in my professional career uh, in horticulture. I worked for Burpee Seed Company and White Flower Farm, and then I worked for botanical gardens that had large orchid collections. But what I became aware of when I did work in at China was how, uh, how as most Americans um, are so oriented toward European history that we don't realize that a lot of these things that, that have gone on in Asia long before the Europeans even thought about it. And, um, and this was just the old ancient uh, poem by a Chinese poet talking about the, the gentle breeze and the, the liberating fragrance of, of orchids. And I think in this case, he was talking about uh, the cymbidiums, which we'll talk about later, which we don't really think about cymbidiums as being greatly fragrant, but some of the species are, have a light fragrance to them. 
The other thing I found is in looking into this whole thing about fragrance is it's very cultural uh, as far as what fragrance smells good and what they like. I mean, if you talk in real generalities, and it's just a generality, uh, in general, um, a lot of the Asian cultures uh, are more enamored with very light fragrances. Probably Nia Finetti or Nia Phoenicia is one of the ones that's very popular. Uh, and Americans tend to be, uh, I mean, the one American growers tend to be more interested in very strong fragrance uh, orchids, especially ones like Catleas. It's just kind of interesting cultural thing. Next slide. It's it's amazing how important scent is to our culture, but how little we really know about it. You know, if, if we think about our other senses, of the sight and feel, um, it's something that we're more aware of many times. Um, but the scent is really very important to us. We'll talk about that later, but it doesn't have a lot of attention compared to some of our other scents. Next slide. The other thing that happens is that um, smell, as Helen Keller said, I mean, certainly, you know, when a person like Helen Keller loses one scent, her scent, her uh, her uh, eye vision, her vision, other other uh, different sensory perceptions become stronger. And uh, with her, smell was very important, and it can transport you to thousands of miles away. You know, if you lived, I lived in Hawaii for a while, and I worked in a botanic garden there, and different smells that I had from Hawaii are ones that are in the back of my mind, but if I would smell them again, they would bring back that memory of me in Hawaii. And you know, you have the same thing uh, for for years of, of uh, if for, for instance, if you, if you went to a prom and uh, you're, um, and your date gave you a corsage, and it was gardenia. Um, if if that was a pleasant experience, uh, hopefully it was. Um, you when you smell that gardenia again, it will bring back that good memory. Now, of course, the opposite can happen with that too, because my mother, who was really dear to me, um, when she died, she had a casket covered with roses, and I found that smell the rest of my life so repugnant. And I didn't know why. I didn't put it together until I realized it was for my grandmother's casket. So smells are really embedded in us. And sometimes we don't even know they're there, but the, the ability to smell something has memories that go with it. Next slide. It's interesting, too, that there are that our strongest ability to smell is when we're ages 20 to 40. So uh, what's new about that, right? A lot of our senses are better, our hearing, our, our, scent, our uh, vision. Uh, and in general, uh, men seem to have less of a perception of sense than females. Um, and uh, that's kind of an interesting thing, but I, I notice that with my wife a lot of times. She will smell things that I don't even perceive. So uh, next slide. Um, the other thing is that is the number of scents that there are. I mean, I don't know who actually came up with with actually coming up with these numbers, but supposedly there are between four four thousand and ten thousand distinct odors that humans can detect and are sensitive to. So there's a lot out there going on. Now, one of the things that we have uh, as, as a, in a Western culture in the U.S. is that we tend to be bombarded with sense. And to some degree, it desensitizes because everything we buy has a scent. I don't mean everything, but so many things. You know, now nowadays, of course, people are more sensitive to them, and, and now they don't allow certain perfumes in certain public spaces. But if you think about it, the, uh, the, the the detergents you use in your clothing, your uh, all these different softeners, even toilet tissues, all of them have some type, most of them have a lot of scents in them, and they're very strong. So sometimes they desensitize us to the more freight, more kind of indelicate scents that are around us. Um, other interesting thing is that about 75% of taste is really smell. If you can't smell, a lot of times you can't taste and vice versa, which is kind of interesting that's happening with COVID because that's one of the issues with COVID. Some people that have gotten COVID have lost their sense of smell. My sister and her brother and her, her husband both 
lost their sense of smell. Now, eventually, a lot of people get that back. But so uh, those two are related very much to each other. And, it, and if you kind of want to try that sometimes when you're eating sometimes, if you hold your nose, you can have a different culinary experience. And if, if you're smelling it and you think about tasting wine, you know, you're smelling the wine before you taste it. All those things are interrelated. And that's why a lot of times our fragrance, when we describe a fragrance, we're actually describing foods many times. Things that we can smell and detect, like coconuts and chocolate and vanilla, you know, uh, chewing gum, um, spices. So that's part of the problem with describing fragrances is there's no vocabulary. You know, if you say a tomato, if you say that tomato is a tomato red, you know what color it is. But you, how do you describe a scent? I mean, uh, people that are uh, professionals, perfumers, they describe them by molecular construction. They can, they can actually smell that scent and they can detect the various different chemicals that are in that. And then, then they can replicate that um, into a perfume. Of course, there are very few people who can do that. That's a very, very specialized skill. But um, that's kind of where we are with, with a sense when we try to describe them. And when you, we'll show you some of the flowers that have scents. And I'll bet you when you go to your meeting, whenever you're back together again, take out a real fragrant orchid that you have. Have each person smell it. Don't tell them, don't let them say what it smells like until after you're done with all of them. And then you ask them what it smells like. You will get a huge range of descriptions of what it smells like. Next slide. As we're mentioning, usually we can't really describe the scent. We usually just use similes like it smells like jasmine, it smells like hives, and it smells like chocolate. So that's kind of an interesting fact of the language of scent. Next slide. Some scientists have tried to come up with some way to describe scent, some way to categorize it. You know, we, we think of Linnaeus of the binomial system of what we use in orchids. He tried to also come up with a way to describe scents and categorize them like camphor or musky or floral or pepperminty, ephemeral, ephemeral, uh, pungent, and putrid. Um, well, we, with putrid, we could probably say that, that some of our bulbophyllums fit in that pretty well. Uh, some of them are pretty putrid. So uh, in general, though, it's probably hard for us. If people don't know how to describe a scent, they call it floral. I find that all the time. You know, it's almost like, you know, if you eat something new and you don't know what it tastes like, it tastes like chicken, right? You know, so it's the same kind of thing. They, 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 uh, they usually describe it uh, as floral. Next slide. Um, more recently, um, a fragrance uh, chemist has tried to come up with uh, this description of various uh, uh, scents. And he, he wrote this book, which is a good book. It's very technical. It's very expensive. It's hard to get, but it's interesting how he's categorized these. And the white floral um, is found with most white flowers. And if you think about that with orchids that you have, most white orchid flowers are fragrant, and many of them are fragrant at night um, because they're night pollinated. So um, that white that still holds pretty true for a lot of the orchids. The rosy colored scent is one that smells like roses, which is again a little bit vague because you know roses have a broad range of fragrances. But the third group is the orange, yellow, and brown flowers like osmanthus and freesia, and then uh, the the spicy ones like the carnations. Next slide. Interesting that Roy Genders, a British horticulturist, uh, found this French study and they came up with this uh, for all plants, uh, including, I mean, not necessarily just orchids, but in general, white and yellow flowers accounted for over 60% of all fragrant flowers. Isn't that interesting, you know, when you think about that? Um, then probably after that, most of them are pale pink or purple. Now, sometimes this doesn't hold true for orchids. I mean, there are different colors, but I will find, you will find that a lot of the white and yellow flowers are very fragrant. Next slide. Fragrance is interesting because it's, it is very kind of ephemeral, and it and it is um, it has notes. A lot of time, people compare it to like music has notes, and um, the 
the first, if you put a perfume on your hand or if you smell the orchid, but it's easy to use a perfume as an example, you put it on the back of your hand. The first thing you'll smell is the higher note. Um, it's the one that's very volatile. And then, um, but if you leave that on your skin and you go back and, and smell an hour later, it can be a very different scent. So, and also, and this happens with orchids. The scent that the orchid has when it's just opened is different than when it's very mature. The scent that it has in the middle of the day, if it's a, it normally has a scent during the middle of the day, is different than it is in the morning. So that's why fragrance, again, is very difficult to nail down because it, it varies so much on the time of day and also how long that uh, the, the fragrance in the flowers, of course, is in the nectar, in the liquid nectar. And uh, the other thing that happens is, is uh, the climate can have a lot to do with the scent and how strong it is. Next slide. People always talk about what, what, you know, they get an orchid and it's supposed to be fragrant. And it says in the books it's fragrant. It, it, uh, growers told you it's fragrant. And you get home and you can't smell it. And you say, well, I just got ripped off because this thing didn't have any fragrance. Well, you've got to make sure that you're doing it. First of all, that, that you know when it's normal fragrance is. Um, for most plants, if you're not sure, usually it's in the middle of the day when it's sunny and warm and high humidity um, because then it, it volatizes more. It's in the air more. Um, so in general, that's when a lot of them are. But if it's a night fragrance, like if you have some of the Brassavola hybrids, um, man, oh, man, you, during the day, you don't smell anything. At night, it like fills up your greenhouse, your, your house. It's amazing. So uh, you have to know when they normally uh, do have the people fragrance. And this has been a real problem. Uh, for judging fragrance, uh, uh, I think Jeff mentioned before that that uh, you know some of your AOS judges and you're wondering what how AOS judges for scent, and it's really hard because it, when you think about it, when you go to a flower show, usually it's cool because you want to keep the, the flowers lasting a long time, and that is that is that's dead wrong for fragrance. I mean, so that even if the plant was normally fragrant, if you take it to the show and it goes into a cold room, it won't have fragrance. So how can you judge it when it's not the right time or the right conditions for fragrance? As a result, not very many people ju do judge fragrance, both because the criteria are very disputed and different, and the perceptions of the scent are different from every person. It becomes really hard to come up with definitive uh, description of does that smell good, and what one person might smell smells good, another one smells terrible. You know, for instance, um, uh, we talk go back to the cultural um, uh, cultural thing. Uh, Napoleon, you know, when he when Josephine when he go out and. Uh, when he'd go into battle and, and, and he, and, and she would say, she would, this was in a note supposedly to him that said, you know, don't, he wrote to her and said, don't wash for two weeks before I come home. Because the human scent, um, some people find that pleasant and some people don't. I mean, there's like, you know, you know, that it's like if you had, um, if, if you've lost somebody like your mother, grandmother, and you went in the house afterwards and you smell her pillow. And you know, that pillow smells like your loved one. And that scent is so strong, you don't even know it's there until you experience it. The same thing happens. They found the same thing with uh, uh, infants. They found that infants, infants actually identify their mother by the scent. And when they're put in a nursery, they will go to the mother from the scent that the mother gives off. So um, it's, it's, it's very fascinating. Next slide. Some people also complain that, you know, plants aren't as fragrant as they used to be. I, mean, I don't know if that's just the way it always is, that, you know, good old days, everything's better than the good old days. Or if it also can be because breeding of orchids and flowers in general, until more recently, it's changed somewhat now, but it originally, and still today a lot, most breeders of orchids are breeding for size, color, and form, and um, not fragrance. Fragrance is just something that comes along with it. And sometimes, it, if they're not selecting for it, 
it won't be there after a while. So luckily, some some of the breeders now are actually searching out uh, ones that are fragrant and breeding for that. And even in groups that before weren't thought so much to have uh, fragrance, you know, Catley is probably are the, the, the ones most recognized for strong fragrance. But even now, you know, people have gone back to species of Phalaenopsis to get some of the, the Phalaenopsis species that have fragrance. They've gone back to the species of various uh, uh, paths, uh, Paphipillums to get fragrance. So I think you're going to see more and more fragrance coming along in newer breeding because uh, I think more people seem to be more sensitive to it. Next slide. You know, it's, I, I, it should be pretty self-evident, but fragrance really, of course, has nothing to do with us as humans for the orchid fragrance. It has to do with pollination. Uh, it's, it, it's, to, it's sexual. It's, a, it's, it's attracting pollinator. And, um, and, you know, this should be no surprise to us because when you go, you go to a store, where are all these poor perfumes for? Why, why do women have all these perfumes? I mean, it's not for their own. It's, it's an attractor. Now, of course, some people don't like the smell of perfume. In some other areas, they, they're not allowed to wear them. But in general, they have been developed to attract the other, per, the other sex. I mean, that's what it's about. So it's the same thing happens with the orchids. They're, they're, they're a tool to help them survive. And a lot of them, again, as we mentioned, are, are uh, appear at night and when, when, the, when the flowers aren't as visible, although most night pollinated orchids are white, but still uh, to hone in to a flower, the fragrance helps attract that pollinator. Next slide. So, um, as we mentioned, uh, I, I've never, maybe there are criteria that orchid judges use with AOS. I know that um, New York, uh, the New York group used to judge for fragrant fl fragrance. They were lucky because they had they had they could draw on people in the fragrance industry to actually come in and be the judges for that. But uh, the the South African uh, Orchid Society has come up with what they think are some guidelines uh, to judging, and that's how how intense it is, how strong the fragrance is, does it diffuse into the room. Is it pleasant, which is a tricky thing, uh, whether you consider uh, pleasant or not? Uh, and does it have a rounded uh, perfumistic, is it fragrance? I, you know, I don't know. Uh, there's still a lot of subjectivity in judging fragrance. Next slide. As we mentioned, there are a lot of obstacles, whether one person likes it, another person doesn't. Um, and how and how they perceive the scent. Next slide. The other thing that's interesting about smelling or smelling a scent is actually training yourself to smell it properly. You know, um, I mean, I didn't really thought about this, but uh, uh, the perfumers I met with this um, um, one of the perfumers at uh, Joe. Um, Joe Heidel, uh, he was with one of the large fragrance companies, and he said it's important to smell properly, just to actually the scent, the actual process of smelling. He said what you do is you have to you, you surround yourself by that thing you're going to smell, and then you 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 inhale very quickly, like several inhales very quickly, like that, right over over the nasal cap to to just penetrate and saturate your nasal passages with that scent and also you concentrate on it a lot of times people don't really think about it uh, but you have to concentrate on it and now some people had to have better sense of fragrance than others there's no doubt about that and I, I, I mean somebody like Joe I mean that takes he had to be trained as he's a trained biochemist so he had to be trained to be able to identify the various molecules that he was smelling I mean that's pretty specialized. Uh, but he also, I, I told him, I said, you know, when he was trained, he was trained to recognize 3,000 cents. Uh, most of us don't have that ability. But he, I also said, well, you know, you must really w wish that you had a, a nose of a dog. I mean, wouldn't that help your job if you could smell like a dog? Because how sensitive they are? No, he says, I want to smell like a salmon. I said, what? A salmon? He said, that salmon, they come 
back from the ocean into fresh water and lay their eggs where they were born from scent. Now, can you imagine that? I mean, <laughs> you know, there's some things that, uh, that uh, animals do. You know, we get so full of ourselves, such a wonderful species we are. Some of these animals could do that we can't even imagine, you know. But so anyway, that was his thing, which he was born a salmon. So, of course, he wouldn't have been able to have a job then, right? So, okay, next slide, please. Okay, we're going to go through some slides. There are a lot of different orchids that are fragrant. And even within a species or within a hybrid, there can be variation of, that, of the intensity of that fragrance within that particular plant. So getting plants that are fragrant is it, a challenge. I mean, the best thing you can do, you're lucky you're in California, you've got enough growers. The best thing to do is to go to the place where you're going to buy the orchids and plan to be there in a warm, well, you know, in a greenhouse, it's usually warm and sunny and humid, and smell them yourself. I mean, don't, don't, don't listen to somebody else, just smell it yourself, and then you'll see whether you're happy with the scent. This uh, Cymbidium insifolium is a species that um, is, uh, is, has a pleasant scent to it, and uh, you know, you might try it out. In my book, what I did is I categorized the plant, the, the, uh, the orchids, by the intensity of their scent, and then a description of each type of scent. And actually, I sent, and also, I, I want to mention before I forget, that I did send uh, Jeff a handouts, which describe every slide that I'm showing you. Plus also it gives you, um, it gives you sources. Um, you probably already have some good sources, but I wanted to give you some other ones. Um, so at least you have something to look over and try out. Uh, next slide, please. And I'll post those um, to the website with the talk recorded. Okay. Okay, great. Okay. The Arangus species, um, this, sometimes in the species of the plant, it'll t give you a hint of its fragrance. And you can see that with Arangus citrata. It is citrus, so it does have a citrusy scent. And a lot of the Arangus do have that citrusy scent too, which makes it nice. Next slide. You know, it's funny when I go through these slides, I, um, the days when I, I'm sure some of you remember the days when you had to give talks on um, Kodak carousel slides, you know, slide projecting a little changer, you know, and uh, I was, at, well, you know, when you're doing that, before I didn't have any remote, so I had to have somebody else change the slides for me, and I was, I was in one group, and you know, the worst thing for a speaker is to give a talk after dinner, especially the lights go down because man you've got some snores then you know so i gave i gave this changer to this lady in the back who looked like he was pretty alert but so i i get to sign it and finally I come next slide nothing happened next slide nothing happened i and then and so i finally got her to change it and then afterwards two of the ones that were in the front that were snoring um came up to me and said oh mr froing that was the best talk <laughs> I guess they had a good sleep, you know. Anyway, angracum, um, some of the angracum, some of the, and many of the angracum hybrids, in this case, both uh, both species are fragrant. And actually, to my knowledge, most all the uh, angracums are fragrant. It's nice to have some of the ones that are a little bit smaller if you don't have as much space. Um, one of the things I really enjoyed when I lived in Mexico for eight years was, you know, I had a lot of space, like you guys have in California with bigger greenhouses. And here in, the, in a colder climate, I don't have a big growth area, so I can't grow some of the big uh, angracums, but they're wonderful for their fragrance. Next slide. And if you don't have room, you can try some of the miniature species. Angracum uh, didideri, it's interesting with angracum, um, they, the one that I suppose there's any disadvantage with angracums is they come in one color, <laughs> white, <laughs> but they're beautiful. Next slide. Sometimes the, the uh, inner Intergeneric hybrids of Angracum and Aranthes give you some more compact uh, hybrids that are very nice. Um, this is one I only enjoyed for good fragrance. Next slide. I mentioned earlier and I talked about the Brassabolas and the, and the, um, the most all the Brassabolas um, have fragrance, and most of their hybrids do too. Um, and uh, Lady of the Night, that's where God's common name for Brassabola and Adosa, because it has that fragrance in the evening. So their flowers are not like knock your socks off, but they, they do, their fragrance is really quite wonderful. Next slide. 
Some of the Cattleya species, it's interesting that some of the species of, of a lot of different genera have, have fragrance. And that's why I say that they kind of were kind of bred out because they had the fragrance. What happened to it? Well, you know, it just, that went for size and form and roundness and stuff. But Cattleya luteola, uh, Cattleya forbesii all have kind of what most people call a citrusy fragrance, but it can be different, perceptive, perceived by different people. Next slide. Calia walkerani is really a fragrant variety, and luckily it does, I mean, it's species, it does also come in a lot of different varieties, different color forms, white, semi-alba, and uh, pinks. It's also used very commonly, uh, both for its fragrance and for its compact uh, growth habit, so you'll find it used a lot in the miniature hybrids, um, uh, like Gold Coast has a lot of the ones like that with um, Catlia walkerani in the background. Great, great species. Next slide. Now, this is the case of one Arantiaca and Gutata. Most of the time, Gutata is the one that has more of the fragrance, but sometimes you can find a, a Arantiaca that has some fragrance. It comes in a lot of different color forms, and the, the waxy flowers are all, 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 really pretty, but they last a long time, which is really a nice feature. Next slide. This is an, a hybrid that's very common, still available, Cynthia Pink Lady. Where, I mean, how can you lose with this? You've got two species that are very fragrant, Walkeriana and Digbiana. And um, I would say, in general, when you're looking for hybrids that are going to be fragrant, you know, look for fragrant parents like Digbiana and Walkeriana if you're growing Cattleyas. And uh, because any, most of them that have that in the background are going to have that fragrance. Next slide. A couple others that are fragrant are very fragrant are Atlantii and Schilleriana. And um, both the species, Atlantii and Schilleriana, are, are not easy to grow, to leave at least. So anytime you can find one uh, like, like this hybrid, uh, usually it's going to be easier to grow. I mean, that's part of the phenomenon of, of, uh, of uh, hybrid vigor. And anytime you have something that's a hybrid, a cross between two different species or within a hybrid group, they're usually easier to to grow because they, they have a mixture of genetic material from different areas and so they're more adaptable usually. Next slide. Lelias too, um, some of the Lelias, uh, Sincarana and um, Pumilla are other ones that are this just bluer form cerulea. It is funny though, you know, with orchids, I mean, it, the cerulea forms, I always have to kind of smile because sometimes the blue is wishful thinking, you know, it's, it, it's, they're not really usually kind of blue, blue. I mean, have you seen those dyed phalaenopsis? Aren't they horrible? Have you seen those at the market where they stem dye those things? Oh, they're atrocious. I can't believe it. They're dying of purple and blue. And then the people think they're going to flower that way again. Well, first, for most of the people that grow those, they, they, let, they just have them until they die and they throw them away and get something new. But uh, it, it really hurts me to see uh, something so amended like that when it's they're such beautiful flowers. Anyway, that's just on the side. Next slide. Now, another case uh, where you actually have the Lelias uh, crossed on with uh, uh, Cattleyas, and you get the Cattleya Lelia crosses. Anything it has at Walkeriana is many times going to be very fragrant. So that's a really good uh, sign to look for that. Next slide. Um, this particular epilalia, um, Beverly Shea, is very fragrant. In fact, it was one that was awarded a fragrance prize in uh, New York. Um, but isn't it kind of sad now? New York doesn't really have the orchid societies they used to have. It's kind of, uh, and I'm happy to see your society is, is strong and doing well. And that says a lot for your leadership then, because it's been a challenge, I know, for orchid societies, especially with this pandemic. We have a wonderful orchid society here at Asheville, uh, the Western North Carolina uh, group, but it's been hard not having shows. Next slide. Another epicatlia. And you know, I'm just showing samplings. There are so many out there. I just wanted to give you a range of possibilities. Next slide. And the, some, a lot of the Sacrilalia catlias are not fragrant, but some of the Sacrilalia catlias, the SC types, are fragrant, so look out for them, you know. This is Royal Bow. Next slide. 
Guanagara apple blossom, I think it's such a wonderful name because it both has the color of apple blossom and it has, to me, the fragrance of an apple blossom. Interesting thing about this Guanagara, now called Jack Fowley, I wonder who that was named after, huh? Could that be Jack Fowley? I don't know. But anyway, uh, what I find interesting about this is a huge variation in, this, in the size of this plant. I mean, I've seen ones that are miniature, almost miniatures and almost full-size catlias. It's like, and the uh, interesting thing about the Iwanagara too is that for some reason, some genetic reason, the flowers in general last longer than most catlias. So it's a very rewarding hybrid and it's around all over the place, apple blossom, because it's been so popular and they're still making, uh, making it and still selling different forms of it. And it comes in different shades of this is kind of the app, standard apple blossom, but it comes in pink shades and kind of apricot shades. Next slide. Um, more of the catlia types, anything, anything that has a ranculatia, like the first letter in that name, um, lets you know that it's going to have fragrance. And then when you see the ruffled uh, lips, which again are very typical of uh, ranculatia, digbiana, uh, hybridizing, then that's a real good clue that they're fragrant. And in general, the, uh, in that, the unif, 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 unifolia, the ones with one leaf instead of two, they tend to be more fragrant than the, the, the uh, bifoliate types. Next slide. Another classic, uh, Barana Beauty. Next slide. This was one I was telling you about. I, when I was in Mexico, it's a, it's a native of Mexico, as well as down into Central America. Um, you know, it's, it's a sad thing, but most of the best Mexican orchids are not in Mexico now. Most of them are in the United States um, by, uh, by, by California uh, nurseries. They've been collected over the years and been hybridized and improved. But I did have, I had a uh, Digbiana with me when I was in Mexico. Um, and I, yeah, I, I kind of smuggled it down, you know, that when, you know, we had meetings at our, uh, at our meeting uh, in Mexico. I think a lot of our meetings were smug smuggling techniques, how to get the orchids into Mexico. So we had a lot of creative people. Some people put their uh, orchids, they put them on their hat. And so then when they came in through the customs, and they just had a beautiful hat. Well, I, I had mine. I got mine in, and I was very happy to have it bloom, and it worked beautifully in Mexico because Mexico, uh, you know, has a lot of intense light and uh, cooler nights uh, for setting flowers. But the fringe on that uh, Digbiana, really, there's nothing like it, and it passes that on to probably one of its most famous uh, uh, hybrid sports of paradise. But there are a lot of them around, the, the greenish varieties that have that frill around them, and they're most all fragrant. Next slide. Cochleanthes is one that, to me, smells like cotton candy. Now, I don't know if other people have that same uh, response, but I, I, I find that very nice. It's now works at Wixiella. Um, Cochleanthes is a little easier to pronounce. It is a bit frustrating, you know, to have the names changing all the time. I and mean, it's hard enough to have to remember them one time. I do tell folks, especially as your beginners, that um, on pronouncing the names, I have a few guidelines that really work uh, for me, and I think they work for most people if you follow. What you do is when you see a name like this, Cochleanthes, you, uh, you go, when, if it's at the show table, you, uh, you go around to the people who really are, have been at it for a long time, and you listen to how they pronounce it. And then you pronounce it like them. Now, if nobody really is brave enough to pronounce it, then uh, try to sound it out as best you can and say it with confidence. Pronounce it with confidence. Then everyone will copy you. And then if that doesn't work and somebody comes up and says, well, that's not the right pronunciation. She said, are you thinking about classical Latin or botanical Latin pronunciation. Once you do that, man, it's all over. Nobody can give you any more guff. So just keep that in mind. You know, that'll make you feel better about your pronunciations. Okay, next slide, please. 
and a little miniature Dendrobium eki. Uh, both these species, Bilochulum and Corentum, are fragrant too. Um, so, uh, uh, so I think you know. Nice thing is with the fragrant plants we talked about, we've got a range from dwarfs to to uh, standard size. So a lot of range. Next slide. Dendrobium kingianum. It has a wonderful fragrance. It uh, it is persnickety for some people to get them to flower. Um, you know, I was amazed. Um, I, I, I guess that was the, I think it was the Georgia group, Atlanta group, and a guy had one, and, and he had it flowering in the snow in Georgia. It was a cold night, it snowed, and that, and it was, it, he, they need to have cool conditions to set buds. And, um, and I was, I didn't, I know cool, but I didn't know that cold. But a lot of the Australian orchids are that way. They, you know, they, they have very cold night temperatures uh, to initiate buds. But the, the nice thing about Dendrobium kingianum, there's so many different uh, sizes of them, colors of them, variations of them. And the Australians have a lot of hybrids they've introduced that are wonderful. Next slide. Of course, the whole dendrobium group's huge, and dendrobium unicum is another one. To me, this smells like tangerines, and of course, uh, you know, the veteran growers won't have any problem with this, but it is a dormant. It, it blooms, it goes dormant, and blooms on, on uh, the older wood, which uh, is confusing for a lot of people at start thing, because if you're new to growing orchids, the difference between dormancy and dead it's hard to tell sometimes, it's hard to tell. So uh, once you get used to it, um, but dormant orchids, orchids that go dormant and uh, are difficult for a lot of people unless they know, they know that they're dormant, not dead. Usually you can tell, honestly, because the stems, if they're dead, will be dehydrated and all shriveled up on the ones that are, are staying stiff or, you know, live. And also you can just scrap, barely scratch the stem and you can see if it has green in it, which tells you it's alive. Next slide. A lot of the, the, uh, the nobile types, the spring bride. Next slide. There's a lot of different nobile types that are very nice and fragrant. Uh, this is a species from Mexico uh, and uh, down into Guatemala and, and further down. Uh, the Encicla cordigera is really a fragrant one. I, it's one of my fragrant favorite of the fragrant ones and they have a lot of new cultivars of this that are, have larger flowers, very dark color and really nice fragrance. Next slide. And then sickly radiata, the up, upside down orchid, or the sometimes cockle shell orchid, or the octopus orchid. It's got a lot of different names, but anyway, it's it's fragrant and blooms. And if you do have that one, you, uh, those of you who grow it know it continues to flower on old stems. So don't cut the stems off. Let them keep flowering. Next slide, prostitia, prostitia now I guess. Hariella or odorata, there's nobody that doesn't have a room for this thing. This is in a two-inch pot, and it's amazing how much fragrance it has for such a small flower. Next slide. The Miltonias and the Miltoniopsis, um, again, very nice fragrance on them. I, I think that the Santania, to me, has a kind of a, a rosy fragrance to it, um, but they all are, besides having spectacular flowers, they have really nice scent. Next slide. More of the more of the hybrids. Next slide. And I probably most of you know this or have it, the uh, maxillaria. Now it's changed its name slightly, but uh, anyway, the coconut orchid that has a really strong fragrance of a uh, roasted coconut and an easy one to grow. And the kind of grassy foliage is pretty attractive in you know, in flower, which you can't say that with some of the orchids. Next slide. Uh, Neophinetti or Neophinetia um, is a very nice, delicate scent. Again, very prized by Asians, uh, Japanese particularly, uh, and its hybrids too. Uh, you know, the, 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 these are, you know, grown by samurais and stuff. I think you, you had a talk by Jason Fisher. I know he's really into that. And you see the variegations you find in the foliage and the flowers that are incredibly expensive. I, I've always been amazed at uh, the Japanese orchid growers, how much they'll pay for things. And they, they collect orchids like works of art and uh, they, they will hoard them. And um, it's like a prestigious thing to have an orchid no one else has. But I do, I think it's a beautiful orchid and it's, it's spawned a lot of nice hybrids. Next slide. 
Like I find it's hybrids like the uh, Neostylus uh, Lucinary, um, which comes in pink, blue, white, um, has fragrance uh, because also Rank Stylus uh, Celestris has fragrance. So both those together carry that fragrance. They're a very compact growing plant, and I find them a lot easier to grow than the Neofinetti, at least as far as I'm concerned, Neofinetia. So it's a nice alternative if you had a problem growing that. Next slide. And also they've been crossed on Neof ne Neofinetia onto uh, Ascocentrums to give you small plants with fragrance. Next slide. Some of the dwarf species of Oncidiums are really nice. Uh, the Ornithorhynchum, now, now uh, Ceranum, um, it has both of these, to me, uh, Share Forum 2, have a scent to me, almost, it, it's like a fresh day to me. It almost feels like ozone or something, but I love the scent of it. <coughs> and these two have been used for harbors. Next slide. Crossing them together, you get Twinkle, which has all types of color forms. And this is one of my uh, one of mine on the left. It gets to be a nice big plant. One of the things I will say with these Oncidiums um, of this type, they do tend to get brown tips on the edge, and I just trim them off. But I, that happens with a lot of the very thin-leafed uh, Oncidiums or other orchids that are thin-leafed. But they offer all kind of ranges of, of uh, colors. Next slide. Cherry Baby is probably one of the most famous of all scented orchids. Um, it's very, very frequently called the chocolate orchid or the vanilla orchid. And people say, well, why, why do they say it's one or the other? Well, because chocolate has vanilla in it. So that's why they're, it's confused. I mean, it has, has a scent of, of, a candy, of a chocolate candy bar. And, uh, and it's very easy to grow. I mean, uh, I gave one to my neighbor, uh, and uh, it bloomed around Christmas, which was really nice. And she wasn't really much of a grower, but it was very tough for her, and it did great. It's a beautiful little plant. Next slide. It's not little, I should say. It gets to be pretty good size. Now, we don't think about paths being fragrant. And I can't say they're going to knock, they're knock your socks off fragrance. They, it's a very delicate fragrance. Um, the Delanatia is one is, is most people think of as kind of a citrusy fragrance. Um, the next slide. Um, and they're also, and Millipoinus is supposed to have somewhat of a raspberry fragrance. Next slide. And their hybrids continue to carry that, where you have uh, Lindley uh, Kopovitz. Next slide. And again, a Phelanopsis, most people don't think of Phelanopsis as fragrant because most of the great big ones don't have fragrance. But um, the species, some of the species and some of the so-called so novelty types, uh, and even some of the miniatures do have the fragrance carried on from their parents, like Phelanopsis blina. Uh, next slide. And the Phelanopsis violacea, which has probably been most famous for its, um, for the, um, blues that they've had in Violacea, uh, but normally they're kind of a purple pink. Um, but that one on the left is more typical. The flower is a little smaller than, uh, than Bellinia, but, but they, do, they do carry that fragrance. Okay, next slide now. And then they're used for parents. Um, this one I kind of screwed up on the slide, but it's Violacea and, and, and hybrid and uh, Buena Jewel. And you, the, these are ones that they frequently call uh, the uh, uh, newer hybrids that are novelties, they call them, because they don't have the real tall spikes of the standard varieties. Um, but they do freak most of the, most of the uh, so-called novelties have the fragrance, and they've been bred for that. Next slide. Like this is a, am, Amboensis is another species that carries its fragrance, and Amboboot is an older hybrid, but a lot of the hybrids that have fragrance from Amboensis um, have Amboensis in their background to carry their fragrance. Next slide. And even some of the more common, um, the larger flowering, but probably still considered uh, uh, not standard Phalaenopsis, but do carry that. You see the barring that it comes from both um, Phalaenopsis gigantea and uh, from uh, Ambonensis. Next slide. 
another really pleasant uh, smelling one used to be called uh, Sideria. It's now called Phalaenopsis japonica. This is one I remember when we were in New York one time when they given a, uh, the show there. Uh, they there, there was one vendor that had had pretty many of these, and the Asians that were living in in uh, in New York were lined up waiting to get this plant. It's very revered um, in Japan and other Asian countries. Next slide. Any, the, the Phalaenopsis orchid world, that Grex orchid world, any Phalaenopsis orchid world, there are a lot of them, Joe, there's a, a whole slew of them. All of them have heavy fragrance and they're still available today. They're an older hybrid, but they're still sold a lot. They're tissue cultured and sold a lot. So if you want a, if you want a Phalaenopsis that has similar markings, they're not all exactly the same, but very, very similar. If you want a guaranteed fragrance, if you find anything Phalaenopsis Orchid World, you won't be disappointed. They're really wonderful fragrance. Next slide. Gigantea, Aruncostylus Gigantea. There's done a lot of work with that of, of color ranges. You know, the standard one is kind of the one all the way over to the right um, that has kind of mark, white with purple markings. But now, of course, they have peach colored ones, they have white ones, they've got pink ones, they've got red ones, and a very heavenly scent. It's like almost like a hyacinth, such a strong scent. It's, I love that. That's a great variety. Next slide. Great species. And for another small one, Stigma stalix radicans, um, has kind of a honey scent, which is nice. Next slide. And Trachoglottis, Priscillus, another one that has a very pleasant scent. Next slide. And Sanhopias, um, they're wonderful. Um, and they don't last a long time, but when they're in when they're in, in flower, a lot of people think it smells like fruit or bananas. Um, pretty strong fragrance. Next slide. Not very many bandas uh, have fragrance. This particular one does, Pat Delight. So I guess what I do, uh, there are some species, again, that do have fragrance. And I, I would check, again, with the, with the grower, or, uh, the hybridizer, and see what his intent is on, on the on hybrids he has, or with Fuchs and, and the other guys there that, that are working on this, and find out um, what varieties they recommend that are fragrant. There are some that are, most of them are. Next slide. Um, Zygopelum is a noxious ox off Zygopelum, and boy, they grew so nicely for me in Mexico. Um, they love uh, they love conditions like you have, really, and, and we're at kind of a Mediterranean climate where it's cool at night, not too hot during the day. Um, we have pretty good climate here for growing most orchids because, I mean, of course, not outdoors like most some of you may have, but um, we do have cool evenings and we don't have as that much heat because we're in the mountains. So uh, zygopelums are wonderful, and it's interesting with all the hybrid days all the hybridizing they've done with zygopelums, most of them look very similar to each other, but they do have the wonderful fragrance. Okay, next slide. I think that's the last slide. Okay, that's the last slide I have. So I, I would be happy to entertain any questions you might have. Uh, Jeff, are you the moderator for that? Sure, sure. Let me look here. Um, hold on a second. Where's the chat? <clears throat> Are there, well, people can unmute. I think I uh, don't see anything in the chat. Okay. Any questions? And if people want, um, like I said, the materials and the information about how to purchase the, the CD, um, we'll put it along with the rec this recording on the website. Now, I will mention, Jim, that I also did I did a special for actually the most popular book I have by far is Organs for Dummies, and I did I did and I that that book, that book is still in print, and uh, I I have copies of that, so I I, I can send that out. That's for like fourteen ninety five postpaid. If anybody would like that one, and I I can sign the books, which will greatly increase the value, especially <laughs> if I, when I die, when I die, man, it, it's going to really go up. I, I mean, I haven't been feeling so well these days, so, you know, get, get, get your chance, okay? Okay, did you have any questions? I have one. No? Yeah. Your maxifolia, max, maxillary tenufolia, you said change the 
the name? Is that true for all maxis, or is that just tenufolia? Well, I, I, I mean, I don't, I'll tell you, I'm not a taxonomist, and I just try to keep up with it like most other people do, and I'm not sure. I, I would suspect I respect not all of them because a lot of times when they, you know, earlier days when the, when the plants were, were named, they were named because they had similar um, anatomy, you know, that the flower looked similar it had the same number of plenty. Well, now, of course, the criteria has changed to uh, DNA. And some things that really look physically to be similar, well, like Lelias and Catlias, all of a sudden become Lelias or, or Catlias when they were one or the other. So I can't answer that. I don't know. I, I, I think a lot of them have changed. I don't know if all of them have. Yeah. Also, your Orchids for Dummies is a great book. It's the best book to give to somebody if they're starting out, especially. Well, well thank you very much for coming. I've, I've been really pleased with the response from that. I, 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 I found that a lot of people really enjoyed it. You know, it's funny when I was, um, when I was going to the New York show, um, the, uh, uh, and I was, I was there kind of judging part of the things. And, uh, and at that time, somebody else, some of the hoity toities in the orchid group there thought that I was prostituting myself by making a book simple. <laughs> You know, but I think that because, you know, orchids have always had this reputation as being very, very difficult. They're just different. They're different. And and once you can get the difference, it, it they're not hard. But I mean, they are different. I mean, they're not in soil. They're, they're in a different media. So most people, I would say most people have the worst problem in the beginning. People have the worst problem with watering and light. I think those are two factors that most people go, fall down on. They usually overwater, and they usually don't provide much light. So anyway, well, I'm glad. Thank you for your comment about Orcs for Dummies. I've been very happy with the reception of it, and so thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you have any remarks on encyclias? I have an encyclia that's unfortunately not well identified that has a kind of an aromatic odor that's not perfumey, but almost meaty. Well, there, there, you know, as you know, there's just huge numbers of encyclias, and I mean, I don't, I don't know them all. You know, when we were in Mexico, gosh, there were a lot of encyclias there that I had never seen before. Um, there are, so I, I don't, I don't know. Most of them are grown the same way. That's lucky. Uh, some of them are not as visually exciting, but they do have fragrance. And I, I don't know about all of them there. So if you're, as long as you enjoy it, you know, what's the most important in orchids to me is the enjoyment factor. I, as long as you like it, it's a good orchid. You know, sometimes I, 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 people, I understand the judging thing, you know, big round uh, stuff, but I mean, if, if you like it, it it's it's good, you know. I mean, really, if you like it. That's the most important thing, you know. I mean, this is, orchids, growing orchids, is supposed to relieve anxiety, not add anxiety. You know, you should be worried about every little thing. And even and even now, this is real heresy, but I'm telling you, even folks that are beginning out stuff, and they're buying those noise no IDs. You know, if they enjoy them, fine. You know. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, okay, they're not going to get a judge the show. That's okay. But I mean, I want to discourage people to, to try, try things. And, you know, and it, 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 so I think that there's room for orchids for all levels. You know, you can get as esoteric you want to, or you can just enjoy the flowers for what they are. And if you don't know the name of it, well, you know, and all of us also know, I, I, I'm sure all of us have some orchids that the tag broke off, right? <laughs> you know, when it gets in too much sun and that tag breaks off, and then you, oh my, well, and it was a hybrid. And I always think it's funny when the tag breaks off, then somebody brings it in, say, like a Catlia hybrid, and they say, oh, can you identify this for me? What? <laughs> you know, and the Felonopsis, how can you identify a Felonopsis hybrid that, with no tag? I mean, and there's so many variations in their genetics, but anyway, so enjoying the orchids to me is the most important thing, and, and that's the wonderful thing about orchids. There's so much, so many different specialists you can go into that you never get bored, and I mean, I've been growing them. Actually, I say I've been growing them for 50 years, but that's an understatement. I, I don't want to say over that because it makes me too old, but the truth is, is I've been growing orchids since I, since I was a kid, and, and I'm 73 years old. So I've been growing for a long time, and I still have that. I first started them under lights in my basement, and uh, I've really never stopped. So any other questions? Yeah, Steve, quick question. That was a great overview, first of all, just a positive comment. You did not mention bulbophyllums. 
Yeah, well, they're wonderful. I, I do remember that uh, that, bel- bu- that one bubble phylum that's bubble phylum, which has been described as smelling like a thousand, a uh, hundred elephants rotting in the afternoon sun. And a yeah. <laughs> so some of them, are, some of them are in my book. I call them the stinkers. And uh, and you know what I find, and I, this is just maybe not a, a, a true observation, but what I found, you know. Those seem to be guys grow more of those those stinkers you know i think they like the effect they get you know they say hey smell this orchid would you and then because a lot of them are carrion scented you know and they smell like rotted meat because they attract the pollinators that way but uh, there are do you have a, a pop farm that you like this fragrant or no i wouldn't no. call them fragrant i would call them malodorous or, or stinkers <laughs> yeah. but they certainly yeah. have a lot of fragrance there to attract their they're pollinators. Yeah, that's right. And a lot of them are carrying. A lot of them are, are, you know, pollinated by flies that are attracted. Yeah, yeah. Carrying. And so, yeah, that's why they're kind of stinky. But they serve, boy, the variation of flowers in bottle pollen is just amazing, isn't it? I mean, it's just, they're otherworldly. I always think with those, with, with orchids, that, you know, if you would sit down and try to sketch the most outlandish flower you could ever do, nature beats you. You know, if you look at some of those uh, ball fobs, you can't even believe they exist. Same with some of the pleurothallus and stuff that are these little teeny things, but my gosh, the construction of them is amazing. Any other comments or questions about things? Well, I want to thank you for your attention, and uh, I enjoyed uh, visiting afar. I haven't been out in San Francisco for a while. I used to be coming out in California a bit, but of course everything stopped with the COVID. But it's nice to be able to at least uh, say hey and uh, touch base with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Well, okay. Are you going to go into your uh, show and tell now? We are. You're welcome to stay on if you're if you're awake and uh, sign off anytime yeah. that you you you. <laughs> you yeah. We appreciate it. And yeah. then we'll follow up with you as well. We'll follow up about the uh, the other information and payment. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much and enjoy your show and tell. And we'll see you some other time, I hope. All right. Thanks. Okay. See you. Bye bye. Um, <clears throat> so I'm about to hand it over to Lynn to do show and tell. Uh, we let Steve go first. If you joined a little late, um, I did just want to go back real quick and to the new members that I saw a few folks uh, on here. Uh, that weren't on when we started. We just wanted to welcome everyone. So if you haven't had a chance, speak up at some point and introduce yourself, say hello. Um, But without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Lynn to start show and tell. Okay, I'm just looking for the share screen indicator at the bottom of the screen, which mysteriously disappeared. It was there a minute ago, no it's not. Do you hate that? Hey, Jane. <laughs> do I start the slideshow before I hit share screen or after? What What do you recommend? If you're on PC. I think you do it before. If it's Mac, it doesn't it, matter. You do it before on a PC. Share screen before? No. Open the slideshow first. So that you're That's on what I did. Slide. That's what I did. And now I can't see the share screen. Now, remember what we did last time. You do the desktop button, the little... Windows button and D, and it'll get you back to the desktop. Oh, you're the best. Uh, no, I lost everything. <laughs> yeah, but it's, but it's all down in the toolbar. It's down in the bottom now. See all the stuff down at the bottom now? Yep, thank okay. you. You take the one that looks like a camera, and that's the one that is uh, Zoom. Click on that one. And then you select the one you that got it. we see oh, it. Tell. Yay! We're good. Okay, hold on. I'm not seeing my notes up here. That's dire. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just have people describe them as when they come to them, and then, then they can do their own notes. Okay, here we go. Can you see the, the slide? Yes. Fabulous. So we have a really interesting and varied show and tell table tonight. And um, a lot of, we have, let me get rid of this. We have 75 orchid photos from 25 members. That's a record. And a lot of fragrant orchids were sent in in keeping with Steve's topic tonight. So let's get started. And just to let you know the order in which I show them is the order in which I receive them. So no, no preference here, nothing political. (laughs) 
Okay. Um, so, Glenn Finch, I missed his photos last month and sincere apologies for that. So we'll start with his this month. Glenn shows us Cattleya bicolor, which is a striking Brazilian species. It's a medium to large sized orchid with very fragrant long lived flowers about four inches across. And the copper colored sepals and the um, deep magenta lip is uh, very dramatic. There are other color forms, but I think this one is particularly beautiful. Bicolor is a bifoliate. Cattleya, meaning that each pseudobulb produces two leaves and the bifoliates are notably fussy about being repotted. So repotting of bifoliate should only be done uh, when they're just starting new root, root growth or um, otherwise many bifoliates will sulk until they eventually die. And believe me, I know this to be true. Glenn also shows us his Bulbophyllum tingaburinum, which the taxonomist decided a few years ago should be called Bulbo Pectin venerus. I don't know where that comes from. It's a miniature sized orchid with tetragonal or tetragonal four sided pseudobulbs and with a about a four inch salmon orange flower. As you can see, Glenn grows this beautifully. It's mounted on a, a, a stick and um, it needs filtered or diffused light. So it could be a good windowsill grower in a basket or pot with good humidity. As I go through, I'll try to point out a number of good windowsill growers. Susan Anderson has grown her Phragmopedium fessii into a beautiful specimen sized plant, as you can see here. Um, it fills a 12 inch pot. This species was just discovered in Peru in 1980, and it created something of an orchid fever at the time. There's been a huge amount of line breeding. Uh, it's received 145 AOS awards to date, and it's been used in nearly 800 uh, registered progeny. The flowers are about uh, two to two and a half inches across, and they open in succession. So you can see the, the buds coming along after the flowers. Um, so it provides a really almost a year round display in Susan's greenhouse. Susan shows us her Dendrobium NA. This is one of her favorites. It's a species from Sumatra and Java. It blooms on a tall, maybe uh, two foot tall cane. And Susan was awarded an 86 point CHM or a Certificate of Horticultural Merit from the AOS in 2017. And she named it for her Golden Retriever Bailey. In the lower left, you see the um, award photo by Ramon de los Santos. And that really clearly shows the, the purple blotches on the, on the uh, tips of the um, petals and lips and the, the uh, kind of orangey purple blotch on the column, below the column. This is Susan Stendrochylum williamsii, a species found in the mossy cloud forest in the Philippines at about 7,500 feet. So that elevation tells us it can take quite cool temperatures. The grass-like leaves are about a foot tall. So this could also be a good windowsill grower. Susan got this plant from the SFOS opportunity table two years ago. It's growing beautifully. Here's a little darling. This is um, Susan's Isabella virginalis. This is a miniature species from the coastal mountains of Brazil. It's perhaps the only orchid with this basket weaving or thatching that covers the pseudobulbs. The growth habit is pretty rambling or branching, so it's best grown mounted. As you can see, Susan has it here. The flowers are about, um, about a half an inch wide, so she has a nice close up photo here but they're just adorable. And the plant itself with these net-like sheaths uh, make it an orchid of year-round interest, whether it's blooming or not. Carol DiGiorgio is a new SFOS member. I hope she's on tonight. And she shares two different orchids she's blooming in her house. The first is Oncidium wild willy, also called Colmenara wild willy. <coughs> um, Pacific Bling, and the clone Pacific Bling says it all. It is blingy. It's a very showy hybrid, which came out of Carter and Holmes in South Carolina about 15 years ago. I love the, the big white um, dancing lady skirt, which is, which is the lip of this flower. Carol also shows us Fools to Care, Melissa Brian, Shady Lady. It's a very dark and lovely color form of this complex hybrid about 50% of the parentage is in the Miltonia family, which brings us this 
this um, large, and I can't get my arrow to go, this large showy lip. So very well grown, Carol. Andrea Lodet, Lodat is back with another orchid to show us this month. Phalaenopsis queen beer. Beer, that's not a typo, it's beer. This is a cute little phal or doritis hybrid with uh, enough roots. She had a picture where they were, the roots were probably about a foot long stringing out across that, that uh, table. Enough roots for several fowls. They're obviously happy creeping around in her growing area. There's also a lot of flowers here for the, the, uh, the size of the plant. And the flowers can last for several months. So I'd love to know the story of Queen Beer, if anybody knows it. Judy Carney shows us Dendrobium igneonivium, a, white, a lovely species from Sumatra. Igneo meaning red and nivium meaning white. The flowers are very showy. They're about um, two and a half inches across with a persimmon orange throat. And they flower at the apex of tall canes, as you can see. They're up on the tops of tall canes with leaves. This is a dendrobium we don't see often, so it's wonderful to see it grown so well, Judy. This is Judy Shonorcus Bodleia flora. It's mounted on a slab, as you can see here, mounted on a slab of cork and hanging from another plant's pot up here. Um, <clears throat> it's also a nice close-up of the flowers, the lavender flowers, which are only about a quarter inch across, but with a long white spur behind them. The plant has an aerial growth habit. As you can see, it just keeps climbing down and climbing down. Uh, it has terete leaves, and it's from Borneo and Sumatra from about 500 to 2200 meters. So this grows intermediate to cool. And it does indeed look like its namesake, the Budlea or butterfly bush. Judy says she's had this plant so long, the tag is in her late husband Frank's handwriting. Frank was the um, original orchidist in the Carney family. The tag says it's Oncidium gravesianum by Forbesii, but in 1989, the hybrid was actually registered as Oncidium or, Go or Gomza grafo. Both species here are Brazilian epiphytes, or sometimes they're terrestrials, found between 2,500 and 5,000 feet. And I think the, the color contrast and the ruffling on the petals of lip are just, just delightful on this flower. <clears throat> this is Judy's Phalaenopsis celebensis, which she grew from a flask that she purchased at POE in 2016. She potted it out in March of 2016 of 2016, and this is its first blooming. Um, it's a miniature species from Sulawesi, Indonesia, and the leaves are lovely even when it's out of bloom. You see the marbled dark green and silvery white. It needs intermediate to warm temperatures, so this is a nice candidate for window sill growing, and this is a great showing for a first bloom seedling, I think. Jeff Harris shows us his Christocentrum Penang Sunset, which is a charming little primary hybrid of Christensonia vietnamica by Ascocentrum and Palacium, both of which have been reclassified as Vandas. <clears throat> so this is actually now Vanda Penang Sunset. I wouldn't change the name tags, Jeff, if I were you. We can see the Vandacious um, growth habit that it has, this monopodial growth habit. And it looks like its roots are happily climbing around Jeff's growing area. The flowers are little more than an inch and very cute. This is Jeff's Oncidium Tiku Marguerite. This is a cross made about 20 years ago of Twinkle by Soto Anum, and it has many fragrant little flowers. As Steve mentioned, these are known for their fragrance. They're about, the flowers are about three quarters of an inch wide. This is another rewarding windowsill grower, and it or the, the Twinkle parent are often, excuse me, available for sale in the trade. Brookside orchids on the peninsula is a good source for these, and Brookside also comes to many of the local farmers markets, so you probably find them pretty easily. And this is Jeff's Restrepia, Restrepia cupria, the name meaning copper colored. It's a small epiphyte from the Colombian cloud forest, found at five to 6,000 feet, so that tells us it's a cool grower and a perfect outdoor grower in the Bay Area in shady light with uh, lots of water and humidity during the growing season. In the close-up, we see that the two lateral sepals, 
These are the two lateral sepals and they're joined at the central margin to form a syncepal, much like we see in Paphiopedilums. And then the petals and the dorsal sepals are, um, they end in these clubs or these little balls which wave in the breeze, presumably to uh, beckon the pollinator to come hither. It's a very cute flower. <clears throat> this is Jeff's Phragmopedium cardinal, which is a hybrid of Sidenii by Schlimii. And this amazing plump pouch with a rolled edge comes from the Schlimii parent. And the pouch is really beautifully um, spotted, spotted burgundy inside. It's quite lovely. This is Jeff's Barcaria wartoniana from Mexico. The Baker notes, if you all have Baker books, says, quote, this rare species is from the isthmus of Tehuantepec in the state of Oaxaca. It's exceedingly endemic at 350 to 1,000 feet in only two known locations. So um, I would say we're fortunate to see it growing and blooming in Jeff's outdoor area. They say that the flowers are easily identified by the fleshy column, which we see here, which diverges from the lip. This is the only known species of the genus with this characteristic. And the extended lip um, has these uh, purple red dots and streaks at the um, apex and it has three long thick yellow keels. So helps us to identify this particular Arcaria species. Tom Pickford shows us another classic primary hybrid, Cattleya or SLC, Circle of Life. This is a complex hybrid of um, LC culminant by Sophronitis, or Cattleya, excuse me, Coccinia, made by Frank Fordyce in 1998. Of course, the color, the amazing color here, comes from the Coccinia, and this is just a beautiful round, flat flower. It's just what we love to see. Tom says this is a sib cross of Top Hat, top hat by New Ace, both of which have been given uh, awards of merit by AOS. I thought it would be interesting to show the, the genealogy of, of a circle of life in the lower left here, if you're interested. Tom shows us his Dendrobium hibiki, Tiny Bubbles, which is a primary hybrid of den, Dendrobium bracteosum and Dendrobium lavifolium, and I think it's easier to grow than either one of its parents. The contrast of the, oh, there we go, contrast of the uh, fuchsia petals and sepals with the electric orange lip, I think makes this a really stunning flower. The flowers are about an inch wide. They last for many, many, many months. They can last for six, eight, nine months. This is said to be an intermediate to warm grower, but Tom grows it in his cool greenhouse, which gets down to the low 40s at night, so it's very adaptable. Windowsill growers, you need this plant. Go shop for it online, it's, it's just lovely. Tom shows us his Sartilis Toowoomba Sparkle. Sartilis is a, a man-made intergeneric genus made by crossing Sarcochylus by Rhynchostylus. And Tom sent this one to me for show and tell just to see if I could say its name five times fast. I can't. <laughs> Tom shows us this amazing Maxillaria uh, phenocanthra, an unusual species from southern Brazil. The two foot two inch long, excuse me, two inch long basal inflorescences, meaning they come out of the base, the base of the flower. Um, they each bear just one flower, and the flowers are about an inch wide. The only AOS award on this species was in 1987, and that plant had just 28 flowers and five buds. So Tom is eating his heart out, but neither he nor I will be able to take it to judging this, this Sunday in Lincoln, California. If any of you are going, let Tom know. <laughs> I'm sure he'd love to hear from you. He would almost come, certainly come home with a prestigious um, cultural award. So sorry, Tom, but nice work on this one. Do you, do you hear us all applauding? Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Dave Hermeyer shows us this adorable uh, miniature-sized gastrochylus obliquus, or the slanting gastrochylus, which according to Jay Fell, refers to the gradually narrowing margins of the um, sepals and petals. It's found in dense forests at elevations of 2,400 to 5,000 feet in the Eastern Himalayas, 
from India to Thailand, southern China, Laos, Vietnam. And it's a warm to cool growing epiphyte, which grows well mounted, as Dave show us, shows us he has here. Very adorable. <clears throat> this is Dave Hermeyer's Leptodes bonkiana. Leptodes grow best mounted on cork or wood or tree fern to accommodate the growth of the plant into the clumps that it forms. It grows fairly quickly if the plant's happy. These are happiest with moderate shade. They don't want bright light. They need good humidity and less watering after they flower, but not a complete dry rest. Many of us grow Leptodes bicolor, which is closely related to Bonquiana, but Bonquiana is the less common species from the Bahia state of Brazil. I thought it would be interesting to see the two species flower side by side on the right. Um, this is Bonquiana on the top and bicolor on the bottom. You see the whole lip structure is quite different in the Bonquiana. It's, it's more um, simple and open here. And in both cases, the flowers are, are large for the size of the plant. It has terete leaves. And if you're looking for Leptodes, um, Alan Koch of Gold Country is a good source for these. Did I skip one? Hold on. No, I did not. Dave Hermeyer's uh, Ketlea dormaniana is very well grown here and deserves a round of applause. Yes. <laughs> I find this a fussy grower. Mine recently went to Orchid Heaven. But Dave has found exactly the conditions it needs to thrive. Uh, the species was found in the state of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil and the humid cloud-topped cloud Organ Mountains at elevation of 600 to 1,000 meters as a small to uh, medium-sized, cool to warm growing epiphyte. So there's a clue. I probably wasn't growing it wet or humid enough. So Dave's success here um, inspires me to try again. The flowers are about three and a half inches wide and really stunning. Roberta Fox shows us this Ceratostylus redis guama ruberform. This species has a reputation as a worm grower, but Roberta says when she purchased it online last January, it was listed as cool to warm. So she asked the seller, how cool? And he said his greenhouse in Sacramento went down to about 45 degrees in, in winter. So she moved it outside on her, she lives in coastal Southern California. She moved it outside to the patio in the shade and it saw some chilly weather for at least a month after that last winter, as well as a couple weeks of nights in the mid to low 40s just in the last few weeks. And it was in full bloom through the cold as well as the heat and single digit humidity. The flowers lasted about three weeks and Roberta says it's just a, it's really a workhorse. It blooms repeatedly with more flowers on the way. Roberta shows us her Chlysocentron Goku Singii. This is truly a blue orchid. This is as blue as Steve says. They're not really blue blue, but it's pretty close. Um, she says when the weather is cooler, the blue color is stronger. When it blooms in warmer weathers, the, the flowers tend to be more of a, a blue, blue gray or a slate blue. It's often sold as crisp Chysocentron marilianum. The flowers of the two species look the same, but the leaves of Chysocentron marilianum are long and terete while these of um, Gokuskingii are shorter and they're, they're semi terete they're not, they're not tubular. <clears throat> Excuse me. Roberta says it blooms several times a year, but this is the best flush of blooming uh, she's had this year. She grows it outdoors, fairly shady. Um, not, only, <clears throat> not only does it tolerate cold, it seems to prefer it. And this little species is from Borneo. Excuse me while I take a gulp here. <clears throat> Roberta shows us her Dendrobium smileyi. This is just a beautiful flower. This is found in Queensland, Australia, and in Papua New Guinea, where it's known as the bottle brush orchid. It's found on tree limbs, trunks, and in tree crooks where leaves have accumulated to form soil. So smileyi is definitely tropical. This one lives in Roberta's greenhouse, and she notes that it blooms on the old bare cane. So um, as we've said before, never cut off those old canes that look dead on a dendrobium because they're probably going to flower for you next time. <clears throat> Glenn Finch shows us his Cattleya cernua, which was formerly Saphronitis cernua. This is a miniature from Brazil to uh, northeastern Argentina. And it grows both as an epiphyte 
um, up in trees and as a lithophyte on rocks near sea level. So this is an intermediate to warm grower. It can take temperatures over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's most often found high in the tree canopy, often exposed to full sun. So it needs very bright light in order to bloom well. well Glenn Grossi is mounted, as we can see, um, in his heated greenhouse. Charming little plant. Glenn also shows us his Isabella virginalis. We just saw Susan's. This is the mini miniature from the coastal mountains of Brazil with very small Cattleya type flowers. Glenn put a penny in the photo uh, for some perspective. We saw Susan's earlier and she grows hers somewhat warmer than Glenn's, which Glenn indicates would probably make it happier. Um, I love these distinctive um, basket-like weave of, of fibers covering the pseudobulbs, presumably to ward off some dastardly predator. Glenn waters his daily in summer, less frequently um, in the winter. Jan Anderson shows us this gorgeous Sophrolalia Dorothy Elliott volcano embers. Um, all of the awarded clones of this hybrid have clonal names like Red Hot or Fuchsia Fire or Red Rage, but I think the name on Jan's volcano embers best captures the color and the the intensity of the flowers. Lovely. <clears throat> Jan also shows us this nicely grown Brassolalia Kaboom, which is a Fred Clark hybrid just registered in 2015 and with no awards to date. I just wonder what Fred was thinking about when he named it Kaboom. <laughs> this hybrid has just about all the Cattleya Alliance in its heritage. If you look down on the bottom right, uh, it's a very complex hybrid. And I think the the lip, on, the lip on these flowers is really interesting with the salmon and peach tones and the ruffled margin. <coughs> Jan also shows us Cattleya or Lelio Cattleya, Frenchie's Melange Sylvia, another very complex cat hybrid. Jan says this one is extremely fragrant and the feathering on the petals, here are the tips, and the purple splashes on the tips are very lovely, as is the very dramatic, roughly lip. You're doing great with your, with your cats, Jan. <laughs> Winnie Wang, a brand new member, welcome. Shows us her Dendrobium Jonathan's Glory Dark Joy. This is a beautiful dark form hybrid coming out of Australia. It looks like a Kingiana, but it's actually uh, has three or four parents in the background. It's a reliable bloomer and the blossoms last a very long time. This will grow reliably on a windowsill here, and uh, it'll bloom with medium light. It'll bloom for several years from the same uh, leaf axle. So from here next year, there'll probably be another, another spike coming up. Oh, and it's fragrant. So if you need, you need one of these. This is Winnie's Zygopetalum hybrid, another orchid which will fill the room with sweet fragrance and uh, which will do beautifully grown on a windowsill in medium to bright indirect light. Winnie has three spikes on her plant here, so uh, it's very nicely grown. <clears throat> so it's all about fragrance tonight. <clears throat> Excuse me, and Winnie's Acidium Sherry Baby, which Steve mentioned, sweet fragrance, AMAOS, is one of the all-time favorites with its chocolatey vanilla e scent, lovely dark foliage, and long-lasting blooms. Windowsill growers, you need this one too. And this is Winnie's gorgeous Cattleya Love Castle, her and I. Um, BMJGP is a, an award from the, the Japanese um, um, Orchid Society award system. This was formerly Sophrolalio Cattleya Love Castle. And we can see the Sophronitis influence in the striking color and also in the lip. This is a very large flower relative to the plant size and it has many awards here and overseas. Nice, nice job, Winnie. Hope to see more of your orchids each month. Jason Douglas shows us this unusual hybrid, Miltonidium peter comp. It's a cross of Miltonia leucoglossa by Oncidium schroederianum, hence Miltonidium, although this is another hybrid where the taxonomists have had their fun. Um, Jason and Ron bought this plant at Safeway years ago, and they've nursed it back to health. And I think the colors, the uh, color, um, contrast and the uh, markings are quite interesting. Jason says it's also very fragrant. 
probably from the Miltonia side of the family. This is Jason's frag, QF, Ula Ula. I hope I said that right. And he says this flower is quite large, this blooming. QF in the hybrid name means it's from Quintal Farms in Hawaii as a hybridizer. They've registered um, dozens and dozens of hybrids in the last 10 years or so. And they're a really good source for species. This is a very complex hybrid, but Shrag Bessii is nearly 50% of the parentage, as we can see in this, in Jason's lovely bloom. Ron Norris shows us his Vanda cerulea. He says this is the first bloom on this young plant, and he grows it in his unheated greenhouse. The flowers on this blooming are about three and a half inches across, and they'll likely get bigger on future bloomings as the plant matures. Breeders have used Vanda cerulea in literally thousands of crosses because of the excellent round, flat uh, shape of the flowers, the saturated color, especially the color of the lip, and also these tessellated markings on the petals and sepals. Wouldn't you just love to see this in the treetops in Southeast Asia where it grows? It's a species, it's amazing. Tanya Lamb shows us Catlea Tanya Lamb, Bud, C, Bud Seagraves, HCC AOS. Tanya received an HCC from AOS at a Santa Cruz show in 2015 when it had 84 flowers on 10 wow. inflorescences. Wow. 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 The flowers were over two and a half inches and I thought it would be interesting to see what Catlea Tanya Lamb is made of in the genealogy chart at the bottom. Very, very nice. And then I asked, Tanya, so where did the name come from? And she sent me this. <clears throat> this is a lovely story to share with you. I know some of you are probably on cell phones and won't be able to read this, so I'll just read it quickly. Catlea Tanya Lamb, Bud Seagraves, HCC AOS. Tanya bought, brought this plant to a local show, but did not enter it for judging. The judges selected it and recommended that Tanya register it. Tanya was surprised to learn that she did not have to be the hybridizer to register an orchid with RHS. Bud Seagraves was a great orchid friend who gave Tanya the plant about 20 years ago. He passed away in 2008 at the age of 84 when Tanya was able to honor him in 2015 when this plant was awarded. Catlea Tanya Lamb is a long-lasting Catlea that blooms between Halloween to early December. This classy flower represents Tanya well with a beautifully light fragrance and velvety pink color. Isn't that a nice story? Tanya shows us her Catlea maxima. This is a favorite species from Colombia, Peru, and Ecuador. And this is an interesting color form with the, uh, the what I call the ooh la lip. The, uh, the yellow stripe down the middle is um, characteristic of maxima. Tanya shows us Vanda Paki, a primary hybrid of Vanda Cristata by Vanda Tricolor. The flowers are about two and a half inches wide on a plant that's it's probably mid-sized for a Vanda. Tricolor is a huge plant, so obviously the Cristata brought down the plant size. I love the, the dr dramatic, I don't know what you call that, blood red or, or maroon lip, and uh, the stripes and keels that uh, lead the pollinator inside to, to do its business. And this is Tanya's Brasavola cibuleta. This is a Brazilian species, which we don't often see. It has terete or cylindrical leaves, as you can see here. These are terete leaves. Um, and um, flowers are about three inches wide with sepals and petals that fold gracefully over the, the large white lip. It's really a treat to see this species, Tanya. This is Tanya's Moniarara Millennium Magic. And the clone witchcraft has actually received two FCCs from AOS, so it is quite a sensation. This is as close to black as an orchid gets, and it's hard, hard to photograph black on black, but we can clearly see in here, we can see the lip in Tanya's photo. Moniarara is a catamodes crossed with mormodes, so it's a member of the catacetinae family, as we can see from these um, fat pseudobulbs behind the flower. And um, surprisingly, this is not a Fred Clark creation. The hybridizer was G. Monnier. I purchased one of these last year online from Carter and Holmes in South Carolina. This is Tanya's Catlea Mobilani Rainbow. 
It's a complex cat hybrid also with a number of AOS awards. And particularly striking, I think, are the purple flares at the tips of the petals and on the lip. Jennifer Pulaka shows us her beautiful Phragmopedium, and the tag tells her it's Covacii by Schlimii, but it was registered as the hybrid was actually registered by Peru Flora as Frag Eumelia arias. So you might change your tag to that, Jennifer. The flower is three and a half to four inches wide, and the pouch is really wonderful on this flower. Jennifer's close up um, shows us all the, the little fine hairs all over the entire flower, around the edges of, of uh, the petals, the whole surface of the, the pouch. We can see that it's a sequential bloomer. There's a, a nice fat bud forming behind this flower. That's gorgeous. Jennifer shows us her Angraecum leonis. Um, all of the Angraecums come from tropical Africa, many of them from the island of Madagascar, including this one. This is a good candidate for windowsill as it prefers um, intermediate to warm temperatures, and it needs quite bright light to bloom. Jennifer said this plant had seven buds and the flowers are about three inches. They're showing themselves nicely above the foliage of the plant. Mary Garrison shows us her Mastavalia agaster, agaster, which unfortunately Mary hasn't written very much about. I looked, tried to look it up in one of her books, except to say that it is from Ecuador. It's an intermediate growing Mastavalia and it needs filtered or diffused light. It's a miniature with flowers about one inch across. And we can see that the, the throat, I'm trying to get my arrow there, is covered with um, prominent, prominent hairs. And I also read that these are fragrant. Mary shows us another mini, Mazdavalia Andreatana, which is named in honor of Father Andrea, Andrietta. It occurs in southeastern Ecuador and northeastern Peru where it grows um, as an epiphyte in cloud forests at high elevations between five and 5,600 6, feet. According to Mary in her book on, on Mastavalias, it is best grown under intermediate conditions, but it will grow cool. And the flowers, which are about an inch wide and about two and a half inches long, including the, the caudae or the tails, um, flowers can last six to eight weeks, which is great for Mastavalia. Mary shows us her Mastavalia Ivanii, or Ivanii, which is another miniature. This one named for the Ecuadorian nurseryman Ivan Acaro. The flower is about one and a quarter inches wide with very long, graceful caudae, as you can see. Um, and it's displayed well above the foliage. If you're looking to buy these lovely Ecuadorian Mastavalias, check Equihenera or Equiflora the next time we have a show, which will hopefully be in the summer of 2021. Both of those growers typically come, which is wonderful. Mary also, let's see, Dave, oh, earlier we saw Dave Hermeyer's Gastrochylus obliquus, and Mary shows us her Gastrochylus retrocollis, also known as Hariella retrocolla. This is another mini, which is high on the adorableness scale for its flowers that look like bees. It's a monopodial epiphyte endemic to Taiwan, only found in Taiwan. It's best grown mounted because um, of the pendant nature of the plant, and it should be grown intermediate to cool and medium shade. It has a sweet lemony fragrance. It just glistens, doesn't it? Mary shows us her Paphiopetalum wardii, which is a small sized, cool growing terrestrial species with an attractive mottled leaf, as you can see here. It's found in southwestern China, northern Myanmar, in deep leaf litter at elevations of uh, 1,200 to 1,600 meters. It grows best in shaded to dappled light, and the flowers can be up to five inches wide with a stunning, very glossy lip. Path wardii is considered by some to be a natural hybrid between uh, Path venustum and Path sucuculii, according to Jay Fell. I'm sure Mary has thoughts on that. And let's see, Jenny Lum shows us Dracula amaliae, found in southwestern Colombia in cloud forests at elevations of 1800 to 1900 meters, is a small to medium sized um, epiphyte. The charming flowers are about four inches across. Jenny grows it outdoors in San Francisco, 
under her deck in Bernal Heights, and she's found it to be a very forgiving plant. It's been in bloom on and off since July, and she finds it does not require as high humidity as most of her other Draculas. She's growing it, I think, a very interesting pot here. I was trying to figure this out. It looks like glass tubes that are spaced to allow plenty of air in between. Obviously a very happy plant. Scott Simono, another new member tonight. Welcome, Scott. Shows us this unusual, I'm gonna work on this name, Porphyrostachys pilifera, which is a litho terrestrial, meaning it's sometimes terrestrial, sometimes a, a lithophyte growing on rocks. Found in Ecuador and Peru, in dry montane regions with scattered trees, elevations to from 1100 to 2800 meters. Jay Fell on his um, Orchid Encyclopedia says he's seen it growing on volcanic rock in full sun and baking temperatures during the day and really cold at night. So it's, it's pretty temperature tolerant. It's quite uncommon in cultivation, so good job on this one, Scott. And Walter Shim, who some of you remember from SFOS, received the Certificate of Botanical Rec Recognition from AOS at a PAC Central Monthly Judging back in 2002 on this plant. <clears throat> Stuart Meneker shows us his Cattleya Amethyst Star Purple Flame. This is a com compact hybrid registered by Gold Country Orchids in 2001. It's a cross of Cat Mini Purple by Cat Lucasiana, which I think is also called Cat Longipes. It's a Brazilian miniature species. And Japheth Co. Uh, received an HCC on it in 2010, naming the clone Purple Flame. It's a large fuchsia flower about um, three and a half inches across on a very small plant with a very showy lip. Beautiful. This is Stuart's Oncidium trader joensis, which looks like it's about four feet tall with a nicely branched inflorescence. Stuart says it has a sweet fragrance in the morning. Stuart shows us Howiara lava burst puanani with a profusion of charming little flowers. They're about one inch flowers on uh, multiple inflorescences here. This is a foolproof orchid for the windowsill grower. And again, you can probably find these at uh, Trader Joe's or at your farmer's market this time of year. They're lovely. Bill Weaver shows us his Selogeny moriana. And Brockhurst is the clone we see most in the trade, perhaps because it's the loveliest. Marnie Turkell won an HCC on it at the Sonoma County Show in 1998 with 22 four-inch flowers. We all fell in love with this plant. It's a species native to Vietnam at around 4,000 feet, so it's an intermediate to cool grower, which prefers dappled light. Flowers are just so pristine. Bill shows us Cattleya mini purple, a gorgeous primary hybrid of Lelia pumila by Cattleya walkeriana. The pumula brings down the plant size uh, to a nice compact size and the, the four inch flowers have a diamond dust sparkle. You can sort of see it along the edges of dust sparkle to them. Bill is growing his mini purple beautifully with a really nice cluster of five full flowers here. Bill shows us his unregistered cross of Cattleya Big Ben by Lelia Grandis. Um, the flowers are beautifully spaced and the dark salmon or carmine color is clear and clean. This is, this is a nice little tableau with the other plants in your growing area, Bill. And Bill shows us this Fred Clarkara Kelly Longley. So a little story, several years ago, I heard Liz Charlton introduce Fred Clark as a speaker and she said, this man is not only a genius, he's a genus. Did anybody laugh? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and here we see one of his lovely Catacetinae hybrids with the complex genealogy um, shown down at the bottom left. This burgundy colored uh, Fred Clark Ara is one of the prettiest I've seen with <laughs> spots and what? Spots and freckles of, of every size. The flower is about three and a half inches and it's for um, a catacetum, it's really nicely open to display the, the column and the lip. And Bill shows us his Cattleya Irene Teoli Kong. This is a gorgeous little hybrid with some Sophronitis, or excuse me, Cattleya Coccinia, 
crossed with LC Aloha case to bring down the plant size and to pop up the color. That is popped up. The magenta red petals and sepals with a lip freshed with an orangey tone. It's really gorgeous. And Bill, thanks for sending photos this month. I think we see your flowers even better on the screen than we can see them live on the Zoom call. So thank you. So speaking of Fred Clarkara, Chaudi Langland shows us Fred Clarkara After Dark Black Pearl FCC AOS. And she says it's a reliable bloomer for her. Like all the catacetinae, it's completely winter dormant and deciduous. So you cut back significantly and then eliminate all water until the new growths um, in the spring are at least three inches tall. I know it's very hard not to water when you see it growing, but watering it too soon is just going to rot the new growths and the, the new roots. This is Chinese Barcaria skinneri, found in Guatemala uh, and the Mexican state of Chiapas. It's cool to warm growing, and it's the only Barcaria that doesn't nod. Um, it needs to be grown mounted on a, or in very large bark in a basket. It likes much less water in the winter, and it's deciduous, so don't panic when all the leaves fall off. This is Chinese unregistered Cygnoches hybrid, a cross of mass confusion by Warzawixii. Cygnoches is known as the swan orchid for its shape, although I think here the swan looks like maybe he's swimming on his head. Cygnoches is also in the catacetinae group, which are deciduous, dormant in winter, and you must cut down or eliminate the watering until you see those three inch growths in the springtime. Johnny says this is the male flower. The female flowers have shorter um, and wider columns. Um, it's also, it's about a little over 11 centimeters or about four and a half inches across. Um, here are several shots of Chani's Dendrochylum Williamsii. It has thousands of flower, flowers and a nice fragrance. This is one of the dendro, Dendrochylums that has grassy leaves, as you can see here. And it's time consuming to groom this after it finishes blooming because you have to snip out every one of those hundreds of little inflorescences where on other dendrochylums like Wenzelii, the old dried inflorescences can simply be given a little tug and they pull right out of their sheath. Um, this one blooms only uh, from new leaves. It's endemic to the mountains of Luzon, Philippines, and is naturally a cool grower that likes shade. But Chani says it does fine on the shady side of her warm greenhouse. Chani shows us Kefirsteinia tolemensis. It's said to be a cool to cold grower, but Chani says it survives and blooms in her warm greenhouse. It says found in the Tolima area of Colombia, also in Venezuela and Ecuador in cloud forests. And the blooms arise from down near the base of the plant. This is Chani's Oncidium zapii. It's a nicely fragrant, warm to cool growing Oncidium. It prefers shade or moderate life levels. Um, zapii is supposed to bloom in the spring, but Chani says that this one and another one of her spring blooming orchids, Angraco magdalene, is in bloom right now too. So I think the, the weather this year maybe has thrown things off a bit. Oncidium zapii is from Brazil and Paraguay. Kay Klum shows us Constantia chipoensis. And she's always great about sending a shot of the whole plant, which in this case is very important. This is a six inch ruler. Um, so we can see the, uh, the size of the plant and the growth habit. Constantia is a genus of six species found in Brazil, and they each bear a single flower from the apex of the pseudobulb. Lynn, that's a three-inch ruler. Oh, it's three. So yes. it is. Thank you. Yep, yep. So Constantia is similar to Sophronitis, but it's different in the much smaller size of the plants. And also the pseudobulbs on um, Constantia are bifoliate, where um, the pseudobulbs of Saphronitis are unifolia. Constantia is typically is found growing on Velosia bushes. We've heard a lot about those. And it's often, often difficult to grow plants on any other mountain medium, but Kay is growing this in an intermediate greenhouse, and I think this hits high on the adorableness scale too. Kay shows us an Angraecum species from Madagascar, not identified at this point. This grows in the intermediate greenhouse and has an interesting growth habit with um, alternating, uh, where's my pointer? There they are, with alternating dark green leaves um, all the way down the stem. The flowers emerge at the apex of the 
of the growth and they have typical the typical long spurs that we see on angraecums and I would bet that it's probably fragrant. K is Brasavola. Little Stars is a classic hybrid of Brasavola nodosa by Subulifolia from Central America um, and from Jamaica, respectively. Attention windowsill growers. K grows this beautiful orchid in a south-facing greenhouse window in her home. It's really rewarding with those flushes of uh, paper white uh, and pale chartreuse flowers. K has grown this exceptionally well for a long time. This is a mature plant. Renee Reddy, another um, newcomer, shows us this Lely Anceps and Bulls is the earliest recorded Alba form of Anceps. Renee, Renee wrote to me that she says she purchased this plant from the recent SFOS member sale when she was out here visiting her daughter and then she took it home to the East Coast where she lives in New Jersey. Interestingly, this was my plant <laughs> and I'm delighted to see it here um, thriving in New Jersey. Of course, in the Bay Area, we're fortunate that our Anceps grow beautifully outdoors, protected along with our cymbidiums and others. This is a very cool label that you're using here too, Renee. So thank you for submitting this for show and tell. So we're almost done here. This is my gastrochylus acutifolius, which came from Cindy Hill when she closed her uh, South San Francisco greenhouse a little over a year ago. And it's bloomed twice in my intermediate greenhouse. Though I may move it to the cool house for the winter when it will need less water. Unlike the miniature gastrochyla species that we saw from Mary Gerritsen and from Dave Hermeyer, this is not a mini. Um, it's mounted on about a, um, a one foot slab and the flowers are almost an inch across. This is a species from Southeast Asia. And this is my Celia Bella, which I got from Mary Nesbitt of California Orchids almost five years ago. It's grown into a large plant. It's about 18 inches tall in a 10 inch pot. And this is a species from Mexico and Central America. It hates to be disturbed. So I grow it in um, inorganic mix, mostly of lava rock. So I, I don't have to worry about the medium breaking down. The flowers are about two inches across. Okay, so now we're gonna hear my frog saga. In early November each year, I bring my collection of begonias into the house and some to the greenhouse for the winter. Last week after the big begonias had been in the house for several weeks and they'd each gone to the, uh, the laundry room sink for weekly watering, a frog leaped out of the foliage and he was indignant that I was getting him wet. Because I was about to head for the greenhouse, I put him in a plastic go cup. My husband uh, punctured some bigger holes in there for him. And he put some lettuce in the bottom of the cup in case the frog got hungry. hungry. But the whole hour long drive to to the greenhouse, the little frog was peeking out the sip hole here the whole time. You could see his little eyeball there. It was so sad. I'm sure he was wondering what in the world would be his fate. As soon as I got to Bellinus, um, I took the lid off and he hopped up right on the edge of the, of the cup and he gave me a defiant glare. Then he began to explore the Phalaenopsis zone for a good home. <clears throat> he liked this foul pulchra because, um, uh, because of the wooden box and he was looking, I'm sure he was looking for a, a hidey hole, which he found. And he moved right in, down there. I haven't seen him since, but he spent the whole day there, but I haven't seen him since. But when our other greenhouse frogs start croaking, this one pipes up and I can tell it's this one because he's right, right in that exact same area of my phalaenopsis. And we'll just close with a, our usual pet shot, our pet of the month, photo. This is from Jeff Harris. He calls his collage Rocket the Cat Considering a Cat Mask. I think his expression is more like, and what do you expect me to do with this silly cat mask? But it's a very cute kitty. So that's it for tonight. Thank you all for your photos and happy holidays. <laughs> Lynn, uh, Angelique Nguyen asked if we got her photos. I did not. Uh, did she send them to me? Uh, I thought so. I was CC'd on them, so I thought so, but maybe. Sorry. Uh, might I'm be so my. Sorry, I missed so sorry, Angelique. Uh, I'm sorry, Angelique. I didn't. I didn't receive them. If you send them to me again, I'll start next month with them. I'm sorry. Seems like I always miss somebody. I know. Sorry. <clears throat> um, thank you so much. Great, great job, Lynn. Welcome. Yeah. You're very welcome. 
Um, that was great. Thank you, Lynn. That was Mary, great. thanks for joining us tonight. Excellent. Um, okay. So I've been, uh, well, John's been working with me in the background to get everyone into a spreadsheet to try. I saw this on the Peninsula uh, Orchid Society. They used a random number generator instead of cutting up little pieces of paper like Joe and I have been doing. So um, I was going to try to do that to distribute these. We're very close in number of attendees that are members uh, to the 65 that we have uh, gift certificates to give away. <laughs> so it's going to be a close call tonight. Um, so let me just share my screen. But I wanted to say I've been going through the list. And so if you haven't checked the chat, please check the chat right now at the bottom. Um, I may have privately chatted you, um, and everyone's welcome, but I just needed to confirm some names that either I wasn't sure if they were, you were a member or of your email, because when we're all done with this, I have to contact everyone to send you your raffle prize. So if I can't tell who you are, there's no way for me to email you, all right? So, um, yeah, so just please be sure to, to do that and or email me separately, okay, um, after the meeting and we'll follow up. Okay, so here we go. So this is what we're going to do. So I think everyone can see this. We have a spreadsheet and John's and I have been working on, this is alphabetical by first name based on everyone that we got logged in. And, um, and then everyone that did show and tell, I, I moved over into this separate list. So we have uh, three $50 gift certificates from Robert Fuchs from um, RF Orchids in Florida. The, for those that don't know, he's also the current president of the AOS. Um, <clears throat> so I was gonna start with these and then I'll just kind of cross people off as we go here. And Where'd the random number generator go? Okay, so we have, let's see if I can do this right. <laughs> okay, so I need a number between two and 24. This is cool. This is kind of high tech, but I, I saw ISIS do it and it looks so easy. <laughs> okay, so the first person is number two on the raffle list. So that is Glenn. So Glenn, you got one of these. Thank you so much. <laughs> and the next one is number 19. So that is Stuart. And the next one, we'll see if this is efficient, but this is <laughs> versus and fair. Uh, 24 is Renee. So you three won the $50 gift certificates from Robert Fuchs from RF Orchids. Wow, that's great. Okay, so congratulations. So next, we want to thank Angelique Nguyen that owns Orchid Design. Um, so we're going to take, let's see, I'm going to take these 15 and I'm going to, so I'm doing the people that did show and tell first. Um, because usually we give you an extra, <laughs> uh, but everyone should get one, but I just wanna make sure I do it this way. Let's see if this works. Okay, so it's a little wonky, but let's try this again. So I'll keep going and I'll skip the people that already won. So 20 is, oh, uh, I'll do this here, it's Bill Weaver. And, Five is Andrea Laudet. And 14 is Tanya Lamb. And 22 is Kay Klum. And nine is Roberta Fox. 
and 21 is Chani Langland. So I just have to make sure I don't overdo these. Let me make sure I do. <laughs> we'll, we'll keep going here. Uh, we already did five. Let's see here. 21, I think we already did 21, right? Yep. 15 is Mary Gerritsen. And 16 is Jennifer Palakis. And 20, I think we already got 24. That's Renee. Let's do it again. This is Judy Carney. <clears throat> 21 was, boy, it didn't seem very random, but let's see. <laughs> Four. Uh, Carol DiGiorgio. I think there's an R. Yeah. I got one. Okay. Um, very good. Two. Ten is Jan Anderson. So that's what one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One. I got four more. So number fifteen. That's Tanya. And Sixteen. Thanks for bearing with me. This is the. Uh, this is actually easier than me making tags. So, <laughs> uh, thirteen. Ron Norris. Seventeen. Jenny Lum. Eighteen. Scott Simono. One, two, three. I think there's one more here, right? Three is Susan Anderson. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. It's fifteen. That's fifteen, right? Yep. All right. So let's see. I'm gonna do this. So now these folks, I'm gonna just go ahead and do. How many are there? <laughs> uh, one. Two, three, four, five. So I think I'll take, there's one of them that had five. Where is it here? I think it was from Hawaii, right? Or no, from Mary, from um, Bolinas, from California Orchids. There you go. From Mary Nisbet. So the five of you that did the rest of you here are going to get a $20 gift certificate from Mary Nisbet and Cal and Bolinas from California Orchid. So that's Tom Pickford, Dave Hermeyer, Winnie Wang, Jason Douglas, and Lynn Morell. Okay, so those are all the people that did show and tell. And now I removed all the names from that list. So the rest of us are here. <laughs> so hopefully this madness makes a little sense. Let's see here. So we have 32 more to go. And so now I need the random, let me, if I do this right. Okay, so there are more names than, so first of all, let's make sure everyone's here. <laughs> so, How do I do this? Stop share for a second. I'm gonna just look at the list. So we still have 62 people here. So people are holding strong. Okay, I already removed the people that weren't members. So if you don't get one, I apologize, but we did our best to up the numbers. I just wasn't sure we were gonna get more than 65 people. <laughs> so we will proceed. Um, so I need from two till 48, right? From two to 48. Jeff. Yes. 
If you're not on there, why? What? Me? If you're not in there, why? Uh, Joe's on here. So. Judy, are you not on there? No, I... Oh, Judy. Okay. Yeah. Wait a minute. Okay. Thank hey, you for speaking up. Jeff, would it be faster to pick the people who don't get one? Oh, I can't hear. Would it be Do faster to pick the people who don't get one? Well, I'm trying to assign them because there's six different one so rather than me picking i was going to try and do a raffle so uh you know this works it's faster than in a meeting yeah i'm going as fast as i can go here uh judy you're actually oh. are here you're you just don't have your last name but it's you're here can you screen share again oh sorry uh angelique asked why she's not there angelique is oh shoot wait a minute stupid thing there you go angelique is there i saw her hold on jen jen lee jen anderson number 25 i think she was on the other list wasn't she angelique jen anderson was on the show and tell list as I was anderson was 10 on the show and number 10. there yeah Okay. So was Winnie, Winnie Wang. Okay, good. Good job. Okay, well, maybe we should proof these. <laughs> All right. So Vincent, Valerie, Tyler, Steve. Sopan's a new member. Welcome. Um, Sam, uh, Ron, and Jason. So some people are combined. They should have been on the show and tell list, but. Um, Rick, is it Rick and Kiming, you're new members as of like today, I think, or recently, right? Yeah, I actually um, just joined doing the meeting. Okay, well, welcome. Yeah, and actually I'm the same person. It's just that uh, I, I was logging through a different name. Okay, well, we'll save one, I'll put you on once. Is that all right? Do you want yeah. Rick or yeah. Kiming? <laughs> uh, that's, that's fine, uh, I, I just, yeah, sometimes it's just automatically fill out the name that I use. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's keep checking these. Thanks, everyone. Lisa, Lily Go, Lillian Derrigan, Larry Roberts, Kentisha, Kevin, is it Kevin Didi? Are you on? Yes. Okay, I think I tech chatted you. I thought that was you. Karen, Judith Brass, John, Joe. Joe left the building. We'll take Joe off the list. <laughs> Judy, Gia, Jerry, Jean Lee, um, Helen, Heidi, Jeff, Florence, Eric, Edith, and Paul, Earl, and Kathy, Diane, Deborah, Corey, Claire, Christian, Sherry, Faye, Cecil, uh, Carolyn, Brianna, Antoinette, Angelique, Angelique, <laughs> uh, Andy and Barbara, Andrew, Andy Smith, and Allie Fishman. Is there anyone who wasn't on the show and tell list that already got picked that is not on here that is still here? Speak up or, all right, here we was go. Ron, was Ron on both lists? Or oh wait 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 good point yeah Ron, Ron and and um, Jason. Jason should have been on the show and tell list they were on they were they were on the show and tell list so they already won oh they were okay you're right so I'm going to take them off of here good call and let me um, sorry that, that you're having to sit through it but that's the way I have to do this <laughs> to keep up. Uh, if anyone wants to take over doing this, I'm more than happy to hand it off. You're doing great. You're doing just great. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to ask you to uh, teach a colleague of mine because we're doing this in a couple weeks. Yeah, I also had to, you know, get all the gift tickets. So we we we're, we want to thank all the vendors for for being so generous as well. Um, That's really yeah. outstanding. They all came forward. That's wonderful. Okay. If it's one per if it's one per household, you should take me off. 
Okay. Even though I had nothing to do with Dave's orchids. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. So what did I say we have left? We have 30, 40, uh, I forgot what I said. We have 32 left to give away. And we have, so 45 minus one, so 44 people. So is anyone on here that's not still on the meeting? I think I called all the names. So I think we're just gonna call the names and it's a raffle. That's the best I can do, I'm sorry. <laughs> So back to the random number generator. So it's up through 45, two to 45. All right, here we go. 37 is, so I'm gonna start with, uh, we'll start from this end. This is the ones from Hawaii, from Maui, from uh, Tropical Orchid Farm. And that was, I forgot what the number was already, 37 is it's a Perla, right? Is that right? This is getting hard. Okay. <laughs> Number 13 is Christian, our newsletter editor and board member. Number nine is Carolyn Fisher. Number 38 is Mickey. And number 30 is Judith Brass. Number 31 is Karen Olson. So that's, when do we got two, four, oops, I put them in the wrong column, sorry. Um, that's half of them. We're keep going. 42, Steve. 24, Helen. Um, 26, it's Jerry. 27, Gia, okay, where are we at here? <laughs> one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I've got three more. 39, Kameen. I think we already had 24. Right? Yep. It's testing my memory as well here. So, so yeah. uh, 12 is Cherry, and we got one more. 44 is Valerie Mountain. Okay, now we move over to Sunset Valley. There's probably a better way to do this where I move everyone, but now that I see it, is that what you're doing? Oh, thanks, John. John's helping me in the background here. <laughs> okay, are we gonna tag team? All right, 41. <laughs> 41 is Sopan. Woo-hoo. Okay, so we have 20 to go. So we like to hear woo-hoo. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 21 is Florence, Sunset Valley. Number four is Andy and Barbara, Cameron. And 43 is Tyler. And 15 is Corey, and 20 is Eric, 41 
So open you already won, so I'm gonna do it again. <laughs> Six is Angelique. Um, 18 is Earl. Um, 22 is Jeff. <clears throat> Seven is Antoinette. I think we already did 24. All right, 11 is Faye. Thirty four is Larry. Jeff on twenty four again, Jeff. I think that I don't think anybody um, she didn't win previously. Hel Helen? Yeah, she won. Oh, sorry. That's Looking okay. at the wrong light. <laughs> I'm I'm, a, I'm in a roll, but thank you. Watch <laughs> me watch me carefully. Uh, okay, how many oops, I guess I can't hear. Uh, Larry. This thing. Okay, how many do I have here? One, two, eleven. Okay. So I got nine more. One, two. Three, mm, now you have twelve. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. What? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay, so I have eight more. I uh, actually thought Inga Frolova was still a member. I no, she didn't renew. So. Got it. Okay. Um, 34, I think we just did, okay, okay, uh, 40, Sam. You, you can pass on mine if, if Dave already got one. Okay, uh, 19, all right, I'll do that. 19 is Edith and Pearl Paul. Um, three is Andy Smith. Twenty-seven is now. Wait a minute, Gia. I thought Gia already. Oh no, I just read names earlier, right? <laughs> right, right. Okay. Uh, twenty-eight. Is Judy Bly and fifteen? Corey, you already won. Sorry if I'm making you guys seasick here. I'm just trying to move quickly. And for is Helen. Ten is Cecil. Um, Twenty-one. I think we already got this. Florence. Seven, Antoinette, five, Angelique Fry. Okay, How many do we have, John? I'm checking. <laughs> Good call. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. I think we got two more, right? Um, Okay. okay, someone's texting me. Okay, that's weird. <laughs> Bad timing. All right, 34, did we already get 34? We did, Larry. 12, Cherry, wait, no, she went already. 24, we already got 30. Judith, I'm sure you want to. Okay, I, we gotta do it differently for the last ones. We're gonna be going around and around here. Okay. 42. Yeah, Steve already won. Steve, right. Okay, we gotta move these columns so I don't have to do this. This isn't, it's a, not efficient at the end here. <laughs> so, 38 already, already got through. 
All right. What I'd suggest doing is, is turn on filter for the two ones they've already done and then filter out all the X's. Yeah, uh, okay, let's do this. Um, yeah, how do I do that? <laughs> so just, so, so select uh, columns A through F and then go over to that little funnel on the far right. Okay. And then the, over on the far right, the funnel tool. Yeah. Yeah, that, okay. And then let's see, let's do, fil the, let's do filter view here. Uh, you just hit create new filter view, that'll work. Okay, and then you can, now you have the little funnel on, on SVO20, the little, the little triangle there. Yeah. Click that, and then just, uh, uh, should pop up a little thing there when you click that. Is anything happening? Yeah, so just uncheck the X. Okay, have you got to 20 in that? No, we have two more to go. Oh, okay. Yeah, maybe it's premature to do this. So this would be <laughs> what you would do for the TJ one at least. Yeah, why don't you fill in the last two here before and then we can filter okay. it out for the TJ one. All right, 43, uh, Tyler. Aye, aye, aye. I'm sorry, everyone, six. Angelique, 32, Kevin, Yay. one more, we need one more, <laughs> 31, did we have a 31 already? Karen already won, 16, Deborah, okay, all right, now we're, now we can do what you were trying to get me to do, so so how do we do this? I click on this, and what does it do? It'll select them all? Yeah, well, it'll, it'll, it'll hide all of the ones that already have an X on them. And do the same for the column F1, too. Okay, I, I learned a new trick. Yeah. All right. Okay, so now I only have, oh, okay, so I have these folks. So if I do this, can I copy and paste this, or will I have all the things in between? Well, maybe you should just make a make a new set of numbers in column C for those. Just like wait, so you have oh, you have oh I see. Yeah, another, we'll call it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, you guys are too smart. All right. Uh, wait. Sam so, said to skip him. Sam said to skip him. Keep sneaking back in there. Let's see. <laughs> 11. All right. So, ah, uh, this is so close. So we have, we have 10 and only 11. No, wait a minute. Let's see. You know what, everyone, I, I will, we have, we must have a spare. Uh, I'll, everyone will get one. So if there's only 11 people left, I can do this. I nominate the club to buy one if we don't have one already. Yeah, we can do that. I actually think there's a spare somewhere. Okay, let's do that. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. So thank you for bearing with me. Um, and, you know, uh, it's been a difficult year, but we've managed to still have fun and keep everything going. And I just want to thank everyone for your ongoing support. Um, I definitely need some folks to help us next year, um, either for board positions or for the two displays or other things that come up. Um, you know, I think it's unlikely we're gonna be able to do a real show, but we can do displays and we can do, uh, we've learned that we can do a sale. So we may do a summer sale and make it wait till weather's a little better <laughs> and do another sale mid-year. Okay, so it's all, Merry Christmas. I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead, speak up. Merry Christmas. Oh, you too, Merry Florence. Christmas. Happy New Year. Happy, Happy holidays, everybody. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Christmas. Merry Christmas, everybody. Kudos to New Year. Year. I just want to say <laughs> thank you for the holidays. You made, you made the uh, lemonade out of Merry Christmas, everybody. Happy whatever. Go. Yes. Good night. 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 Good night.
Great meeting. Happy, thank happy. you, Jeff. Stay thank healthy, you. Dog. Making it all thank, so thank you, Jeff, for going through the process. Appreciate yeah. it. Sure. <laughs> thank yes. you. Happy to do yeah, it. I learned something new. Great job, Lynn, too. The, for the yes, thank you. I always help. learn something new. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Outstanding. Oh, I learned a lot. Bye bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Good night, all. Good night. Good night. Bye. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Come on, close. Hey, Jeff. Who's that? Faye? Yes. Hi, Faye. Hi. <clears throat> um, so did you were you able to give everybody? Yes, we had just an well, I have one extra tiny jungle left over from before so yes we got it oh uh, okay why i actually went to drop off that uh, check for john leathers this morning oh i was gonna i was gonna pay um no i i tried paying him paypal but paypal um gave an option to have the money on december uh, it was already the the payment has already been made but then paypal said that there is a clearing day 